everybody. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. A while back, earlier uh, this summer, I did an episode with my filmmaker friend, Nathan Douglas, discussing cinephilia in Walker Percy's novel, uh, The Movie Goer. And at the time, I promised that I would be doing at least one more Walker Percy episode in the near future. Um, and I wanted to talk about his, his third novel, Love in the Ruins, as well as give more of a kind of a general discussion of his work. And so that's what we'll be doing today. So uh, I'll mention quickly, uh, just to do a, a short promo uh, before we get into it, because I mentioned last time that uh, the reason I started reading Walker Percy's novels, I've been reading um, one every month in order of publication, uh, starting a few months ago. And the, the reason I ended up doing that is uh, part of this online great books program. It's a great remedial uh, liberal arts education for me because I went to music school instead of uh, finishing a four-year uh, liberal arts program. So um, it's it's a really nice opportunity, great great community of, of people going through the great books list at a very accessible uh, pace um, for, for people who have jobs and families and all that. And, uh, they send you the books every month and it's, it's mainly the seminars are the main value you get out of it. Less lectures, more discussion. Uh, so for people who want to, uh, check out the online great books program, you can actually get 25% off your first three months with the program by using the link in the show notes or going to onlinegreatbooks.com and using the discount code Catholic Culture, And uh, you'll immediately be put on their VIP waiting list and receive some nice uh, digital materials before uh, your actual seminar is ready. Anyway, the reason I mention is that sort of as an extracurricular, a bunch of us have been going through Walker Percy's novels. So today with me is Jessica Houghton Wilson. She is the Louise Cowan Scholar in Residence at the University of Dallas in the Classical Education and Humanities graduate program. She's the author of three books, including two on Walker Percy, reading Walker Percy's novels and Walker Percy, Fyodor Dostoyevsky and the Search for in Influence. And uh, I believe a editor of an unfinished novel by Flannery O'Connor, is that right? That's true. I uh, will have to wait to see if that ever comes out, but I did edit her unfinished work. Okay. Okay. That's great. Well, uh, Jessica, thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. I'm excited. I love talking Percy anytime I get a chance. So I've done the first three now, and I have to say Love in the Ruins is my favorite uh, of the three uh, so far. Yeah, absolutely. I find it to be one of his probably his funniest novel. I'm always hesitant. Am I saying something truthful if I say that? But uh, I do think that it's probably the one you laugh out loud the most in. Yeah, you know what? I, I think there, yeah, that that's very true. I found the moviegoer uh, hilarious and I found Last Gentleman entertaining too, although I had on first reading i wasn't sure at the end whether i really followed kind of i got it thematically but the plot is just so all over the place in that one um but in this one you know one reason it's my favorite of the three is that there's more external drama mm -hmm. in the story mm -hmm. um there's more uh there's more of it sort of a, a sense of adventure it feels to me anyway i could be wrong about that um th there was something um I don't know. There's sort of a cheeriness to the character, even though he's so messed up. Mm -hmm. I think that that makes it fun to read. So uh, I was wondering if we could start before we get deep into Love in the Ruins uh, with just kind of an overview, because in my previous episode, I didn't really talk too much about Walker Percy's life and kind of his his place in Catholic letters more more widely. Um, could you kind of give my audience an orientation to uh, Walker Percy's life and work? Sure. Yeah. You know, when I was dating my husband, he knew that I was a literature professor. And so I think in his imagination, I was like teaching old English or something <laughs> really distant from yeah. human beings. And I had to completely correct him and say, no, I, I'm teaching people who were writing in the 60s and 70s. I mean, I was teaching people who what they were writing was prophetic only 50 years out, you know. And so that's where Percy comes into play is that he's He's born in 1916. He lives until 1990. And so he's writing in an era that is familiar to most of us. And if not to us, at least to our parents, it's it's less than a generation removed. It is um, probably feels like our world. It's not as hard to put yourself into Walker Percy's novels as it would 
you know, putting yourself into Shakespeare's time or put yourself into Homer's world or something like that. Hmm. So Walker Percy is writing in the South and he is from a great family that dominated the South. And if you are at all familiar with Southern culture, that means there was a lot of responsibility placed on Percy to either become a doctor or a lawyer or a politician. And those were kind of the only jobs that the Southerners were allowed. So he pursued his uh, medical degree at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and then he went and did his residency at Columbia. So he was pursuing the route of becoming a doctor. And instead, he contracted tuberculosis mm. and pursued a liberal arts education during his quarantine. For for like you, you were just talking about, Thomas, that um, you're now studying these great books that you didn't have access to in college. And that's what he was doing, is he was off on his own at um, Trudeau Sanatorium and reading Dostoevsky, reading Kierkegaard, and reading all the great books he had never had access to during his college years. And they saved his life. They made him feel like there was something worth living for, even in the middle of this sickness, that even if he died of tuberculosis, there was no better way to spend his time than to reading fiction. And so when he was freed from the sanatorium and able to resume his life, he made three promises to himself. One, that he would become a novelist. Two, that he would become Catholic. And three, that he would marry the love of his life, which he did. Mm. So at that point, Percy moves to Louisiana. He felt like New Orleans was the best city for a Southerner to live in. He lived right outside of it in Covington. And he started writing novels. And the goals of all of his novels really were to uh, to kick some ass for Jesus and his words. <laughs> and he wanted to write novels that made people understand the importance of deciding whether or not you believe Jesus Christ is the Lord. And so all of his fiction is kind of geared toward that, that group. Hmm. And well, uh, let me ask you about this, this Southern thing. So you, you're a Southerner, are you not? Yeah, I am. Okay. So I grew up in Virginia, you know, always distinguished as Northern Virginia. <laughs> they're, they're very, they take great care to, <laughs> to make that distinction. Yes. Uh, bougie Virginians. Yeah, well, I grew up in in the Manassas area, uh, kind of out in the woods near Manassas. So there's a little bit of both there because of the Civil War uh, battlefield and and all that. Um, but I never quite understood what it meant to have Southern identity. That's not something that I that I've ever felt strongly. So uh, I wanted to ask you. Um, because sometimes Walker Percy, there's so much about the South and the culture of these different specific states and stuff in his novels that I feel like I'm a little bit missing out on when I read it. Um, and he's such a great observer, you know, I can I can tell. Um, but what do you think it is about being Southern or, or uh, sorry, how do you think being Southern informs his work? Yes, he definitely observes the mannerisms of the South. And in that sense, like Flannery O'Connor, you know, which was one of the contemporary Southern writers, but also a Catholic, fellow Catholic, he is definitely considering that they have this advantage as Southerners because the particularity of their place. Whereas what he saw was the Los Angelization of culture in which more and more places were becoming no places. So for mm -hmm. example, you read the movie goer where he goes up to Chicago and he gets off at the train right. station. Right. He's like, I need the history of the place. I need to know when this building was made. I need to know where I am. And so the South is full of particularity and the people, you know, this is back in the day, right? Like this is not where the South is. It really has to come mostly to, to Los Angelesization, but you knew your neighbors, you knew who ran the mm. store downtown. You knew who farmed your food. You just, you knew people and the place intimately in a way yeah. that was lost in the urban world, which dominated the North and which dominated the coasts. So for Percy and, and for Connor, this kind of localization 
and the um, immediacy of of the particular place like you could tell the difference between louisiana and memphis yeah you know like you know you can hear accents and you can tell the difference between someone who's from atlanta and someone who's from birmingham um you know the taste of the different barbecue sauces and the difference between south carolina right barbecue sauce and tennessee barbecue sauce and Mm. There was this particularity of place that he really wanted to hold on to and that he tried to to depict in his fiction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's uh, one of the things that I noticed is uh, his observation of race relations is really specific. Um, he, he picks up on so many little social niceties or, or not so niceties mm. <laughs> as the, as the case may be. Um, and he's he's clearly critiquing racism as he critiques kind of a certain uh especially in the first novel the movie go or as he critiques a certain kind of like southern chauvinism that's mm-hmm. detached from any real kind of like deep worldview mm-hmm. um but uh there's no like with o'connor um, I'd say that his his work is a, perhaps a little bit more explicitly critical of racism. I don't. Maybe that's maybe that's not true. I don't know. It's. I, I think it's more clear in the thoughts of the characters. Anyway, I think in Flannery O'Connor, you have to like read the subtext. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Am I am I am I totally off track here? No, uh, I mean, I I think what you're getting at is something that's different between when the two of them are writing. So Flannery O'Connor mm-hmm. dies before the Civil Rights Act. I mean a month oh okay contract. i mean so it's it's just a different time period whereas percy writing in the 70s has the context of the civil rights movement and he's actually writing okay. letters he's speaking in courts on behalf of civil rights it's just a different time and, yes. she's writing and, he, and he clearly engaged in public life more than she did he did well. um well, oh. because he had the ability to but also um you know, he also had the family name. He had the heritage to do that. There was just a lot of resources that Percy has that that Mm -hmm. doesn't. So I don't think you're picking up on something that's not true. You're picking on on something accurate, but it's it's a difference between 1950s and 50s writer and a 1970s and 80s writer. And I don't even mean it as a criticism of of O'Connor. But uh, yeah, so so but what I was going to say is one similarity is the the lack of sentimentality in their depiction of race relations. I mean, he is really not trying to make anybody look good. In Love in the Ruins, there's some conversations between uh, the protagonist, Dr. Thomas More, uh, and this um, this black militant leader who captures him at a certain point. And he is just he is just being brutally honest with in, in answering his questions at some point. And you're like, you're going to get shot, man. (laughs) But there's something so refreshing about that. And, and the, and, and, you know, uh, not only is the novel prophetic, but it's also prophetic because so much of what we have going on now was there in seed form at the time. And so I think that even if the, um, like the exact sociological picture is not the same, the, I think the ideological layout is very similar in a lot of ways. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you would not believe the number of times that I quoted Walker Percy, you know, during the elections of 2016 and the elections of 2020. And I just thought uh-huh. we are living in love in the ruins with the way that we are so divisive and we are so, polarized and that's what right. he shows in love in the ruins he's in 1971 trying to depict a very polarized yeah. world in which people don't interact as neighbors but they interact as tribes right yeah so i think the main differences are kind of like the exact borders of geopolitics and the kind of exact the 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 breakup of religious denominations he depicts, for example, is not exactly the same as we have now. But again, the thematically, it's all it's all there. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I guess maybe we can go ahead and transition into into Love and the Ruins. Then, um, you know, his his work, the three novels I've read so far, they all have pretty similar concerns. I would say uh they they have protagonists who are similar in certain ways they're they're uh men who who you might describe as mentally ill if not for the fact that his novels kind of explicitly resist that at least reducing it to that it's it's like a mental illness brought on by spiritual illness Mm -hmm. um both personally and in the society surrounding them um and there's also a sense that uh 
in all three of those novels that they are in some sense more sane than some of the more functional people they're around Mm -hmm. insofar as they're so much more cognizant of that there's something deeply, deeply wrong here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I talk to a lot of people who think that once you've read one Percy novel, you've read all of them. Uh, In some ways that's true because thematically he has this one great idea that he's chasing after over and over again, which is this lost sense of self makes it almost impossible to know how to live the good life. Right. I mean, that's, if you had to like summarize Percy's novels down to a nugget, that's what you would have. And yet at the same time, every single one of his novels has a different style. It's a different genre for creating that message. And so right. you have the movie goer, which is more of a existential novel of manners. And it functions more like a typical novel. It is kind of like by the book of how you write a novel, especially mm. during his time period, 1960s. And then you have La- The Last Gentleman, which is an odyssey and it's a buildings roman dealing with the same question and digging into that and by the time you get to love in the ruins you have this panoramic satire trying to understand who we are and how we've lost this sense of what it means to be a person in the world and so every single one of his novels does this different thing with genre to try to get at the same idea because his goal is always to get you to ask the questions uh, that maybe you're not asking about who you are and why you're here. Right. Yeah, I definitely had that feeling reading the lot, the last gentleman after, right after the movie goer. I was like, I kind of feel like this is the same thing, but longer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just like slightly less tight. Um, but uh, but then reading this, I felt like it was really a fresh fresh take on similar themes. Um, and I'm sure if I read The Last Gentleman again, I would pick up on more more differences and kind of more what he is doing there with the meandering plot and everything. Um, so The Last Gentleman, uh, the, the protagonist is Dr. Tom Moore, a, uh, a descendant of my patron saint, Thomas Moore. Um, and uh, he is, oh goodness, what is he? A he is, a, yeah, a bad Catholic. That's right. He's a bad Catholic. He is a uh, a scientist, um, a utopian, and utopian. Yes, and he's created uh, the the world that he lives in. Is we've got this this world that is, as I mentioned, it's kind of like our world in the 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 polarization, except that society the the kind of um, the functionality of society itself has degraded even more than ours. So, like right now, we have like you know crazy COVID stuff aside, we we have a pretty functional infrastructure and we have a nation that is still a political unit, mm-hmm. technically, mm-hmm. Uh, in, and uh, in Love in the Ruins, it's not so. Uh, so you've got the, the United States has broken up a bit. Uh, you've got different schismatic Catholic sects and uh you know the american catholic church based in cicero illinois um the conservatives there are conservatives and liberals but they all kind of they all kind of uh i don't know it all seems pretty empty i guess that's that's the the vantage point that the novel takes is that none of it has much substance to it it's all increasingly detached from even the sort of like the the Christianity depicted in the novel is increasingly detached from kind of the reality of Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. um, except in so far as he's mentioned as the, the greatest pro of them all <laughs> for the big the big golf tournament that they, they they dedicate it to him, um, and race relations are crazy. You've got uh, the Bantus out in the swamp, uh, you know, raiding people. Um, you've got kind of this uh, maybe the same the same racial hatreds that were on display in the south of of percy's time or just before it um uh yet somehow kind of i don't know (laughs) kind of like everybody's made their peace with it in a weird way like like you've got these conservatives and liberals and they're they're kind of living together in a weird sort of like dead harmony in some places does that make sense um, yeah, I mean, I would say what 
ends up happening in the novel, this the division is that everyone's kind of forgotten the great purpose. And so all of their tribal identities have taken over any deeper sense of meaning. And rather than something like, what is your stance on abortion because your long-term goal is pro-life or your long-term goal is that every person's image of God, like there is no long-term goal. The goal is just like anti-abortion or pro-abortion, right? Like for its sake in and of itself. And so Hmm. it's a world in which it doesn't have any longer or higher ends. You only like the means have become your very ends. Like they've become what you're fighting for. And uh, so you, you mentioned the American Catholic church, like, I mean, you have the the host lifted up and the Star Spangled Banner plays, right? I mean, that's one of the yeah. People. They celebrate they celebrate property rights Sunday. That's one of their <laughs> big pieces, which is hilarious. It's yeah. one of my favorite. Well, and then it's the not head party, right? Which is the conservative party, and it took an insult and made it its identity. Right. Versus the um, I'm gonna have to read the initials. The left Papa Zane, right, which is liberty, equality, fraternity, the pill, atheism, pot, anti-pollution, sex, abortion, now, and euthanasia. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. You know, the way yeah. that he depicts the parties, it's really satirical, but you can see how that even lines up now, where it's like woke versus not woke, and having people trying to identify with labels really is reducing people so that they lose who it is that they are and what they're, what they're doing. The novel begins in kind of a very dramatic way where he's sitting in the woods, uh, trying to find his way around a sniper, uh, who's been hunting him down. It's, it's on, starts on July 4th. And then we kind of go back to July 1st and the novel takes us over those days back to July 4th. Um, and, uh, let me actually read the, uh, because it's such an iconic opening Mm -hmm. sentence. Okay. So this is the opening paragraph of the novel. Now, when these dread latter days of the old violent beloved USA and of the Christ forgetting Christ haunted death dealing Western world, I came to myself in a grove of young pines. And the question came to me, has it happened at last? So that's the uh, that's the opening of the story. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, we get this kind of sense of imminent catastrophe uh, in the opening pages where he's convinced that something really, really bad is going to happen. And that that's something only becomes clear over the course of the novel. Mm -hmm. Um, So a big plot feature of this uh, is this device that um dr tom moore has created the ontological lapsometer that's the short version of the name i think it's the is it the qualitative quantitative or the quantitative (laughs) qualitative uh ontological lapsometer that's a joke that's made in the book but i actually don't remember um and uh you know it's interesting so this is his plan to solve the spiritual malaise of of the world he describes himself as a bad catholic he is someone who takes his feelings of uh well does he lack feelings of guilt or or does he just lack feelings of contrition or does he lack both actually yeah Uh, both until the end of the novel right right so he he lacks feelings he lacks feelings of guilt but he has a sense that he should feel guilty and he should feel contrite for his sins namely uh you know, I sort of the major ones being drunkenness and uh, fornication, and yet he doesn't. And uh, as with some of these other novels, you know, the the uh, what sets him apart from some of the other characters is not that he is more moral, but that he is in a sense more honest or more awake to something being wrong. Yeah. Even though emotionally he's not, he's not sort of. Uh, aligned with where his mind is. Well, yeah, if I can emphasize that point, I mean, this is where doctrine comes in that I think is so important in Percy that, you know, the doctrine has taught Tom Moore that there are sins that we have been created by God and then we are fallen and that we are meant to be redeemed. Like he is very aware as a scientist and a cognitive mind, kind of like Ivan Karamazov. He's very aware that there is something wrong with the world and it begins with him. And yet he feels no guilt for the things that he does wrong. 
And, and this is where I, I think Percy is so insightful. I mean, I've been in churches where preachers have said things along the lines of, um, you know, come as you are, like, don't feel guilty. Don't let your sin hold you back. And I just remember thinking about Percy. I remember thinking majority of the world don't think they're doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. It's actually the opposite. We are no longer in a place where people don't go to church because they feel guilty about their sin. They don't go to church because they feel no guilt about their sin. There's no reason to be there. And, and that's where I think Percy was really on to something is that all of us feel like our life choices are completely justified and that you can't tell me that one way of being in the world is better than another. And yet Percy, uh, Tom Moore realizes, but one way of being in the world makes him feel like he wants to kill himself. And there has to be a better way of being in the world, right? Right. That's what he comes right. to. Yeah. So he has invented this, uh, just, just putting this in context. So he has this moral sense. He has this sense that part of what's wrong with him is that he, you know, stopped eating Christ, Yes. you know, uh, and hasn't been in, to confession in years and years. Um, but then we also have this, this scientific device by which means he hopes to scan people's brains and figure out what's wrong with them spiritually. So it's kind of funny because on the one hand, you have this spiritual awareness that the character has, and yet you also have this kind of this device by which he thinks he's going to solve people's spiritual problems through a physical means. Mm -hmm. And even at, at the end of the book, after he kind of, uh, you know, starts converting, he's still working on that device. So it's kind of like there's this there's there's a certain tongue and cheekness to it, I think, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, in in it could just as easily be that one of the villains is, is, you know, has invented this device and doesn't understand that you can't solve people's moral problems through brain, brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead we have kind of the same, the scientific uh, kind of bizarre scientific material approach and the spiritual approach in one character. What do you think is going on there? What is Percy doing there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the world has become too materialist. So you look at Fedville, which is like this um, medical unit that has like the love clinic where they try to make sex nothing but bodies interacting. And yet, even while he's watching people, you know, have intercourse, he, he blushes, he feels... He feels something that he can't detract. It doesn't, he can't just, you know, detach himself from that thing that he thinks is only physical. And so there's this constant awareness in, in the book that his ideas about the world only being physical are the, the biggest lies that everyone's telling themselves because mm -hmm. there's something inside us that pushes against that idea of only being material creatures. And yet at the same time, um, you have other characters like his wife who goes off and becomes this spiritual abstract character that wants mm -hmm. to completely detach from her body. And that's who she truly is, right? She transcends her physical nature. Um, and he also recognizes that kind of floating into the ether is not who we are either. And that's why the Eucharist becomes so important to him. It is the, the physical um, being inhabited, embodying the spiritual reality that he has to become part of to tether him back to who he is, right? And that's why the book begins with July 4th, a very worldly, his, you know, physical, historical day, and ends with the historical spiritual holiday of Christmas Eve, you know, and leave right. Christmas. And so there's, um, it, there's a movement away from a false sense of identity to a true story over the course of the novel. Right. So yeah, the, he, he talks about this, this angelism versus bestialism a number of times um, and always makes his, his colleagues uncomfortable when he uses terms like that because they're even more materialistic. Um, so I, I, there's a, uh, it's this is laid out in a number of different passages, but I wanted to quote one towards the end of the novel, and this is after his device has fallen into the wrong hands of this character, this fascinating character, Art Immelman, uh, who claims to be from 
you know, what the uh, the National Institute for Mental Health and also the Rockefeller Foundation and various other things. He's trying to basically sign a contract with um, with Tom Moore, letting them get, signing over the patent to his device, give it, putting a bunch of them into the hands of the right people all over the country. Um, and eventually he essentially steals it or he, he kind of hypnotizes him into signing the contract. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he uses this device towards the very end of the novel to just create absolute chaos. And uh, this is the disaster, part of the disaster that Tom Moore is anticipating at the beginning of the novel. So there's this passage uh, that a bunch of people have started fighting. You know, people usually are either start fornicating or start fighting when this device is, is used on them. Uh, and the, he kind of hypnotizes uh maybe that's not the right word, but he kind of drugs uh, Tom Moore by stimulating the the musical erotic uh, part of his brain. Uh, but anyway, so there's this passage where this is used by this other guy. The heavy sodium ions hit his pineal body, seat of self like a guillotine, sundering self from self forever, that ordinary self, the restless aching everyday self from the secret self one happens on in dreams, in poetry, during ordeals, on happy trips. Ah, this is my real self. For after, for forever after, he'll live like a ghost inhabiting himself. He'll orbit the earth forever, reading dials and recording data and spinning theories by day, and at night seek to re-enter the world of creatures by taking the form of beasts and performing unnatural practices. Uh, so that's that's kind of a good depiction of um, something we see with a lot of the scientists in, in this novel, that they're these people who have these kind of very abstracted way of thinking about things, and yet you see them you know, uh, doing the, the nastiest things, mm -hmm. uh, with their bodies. Um, this novel is kind of, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's definitely not pornographic. Uh, but he, he does, uh, when he's talking about this love clinic, he definitely, uh, I, I guess the effect is kind of the sterility that to which sex has been reduced, mm -hmm. uh, more than anything else in the way he describes it. Yeah, and it's in direct contrast to the marriage he eventually has at the end, which is a sacrament. So yes. there's this huge contrast between the sacrament of marriage and the way that love affairs are treated. They're not even love, lust affairs are treating um, sex. And you haven't read Lancelot yet, but um, but essentially Lancelot is probably his more most pornographic novel and in a sense, he's testing you as much as he's testing Tom Moore when Tom Moore is at the love clinic, right? Mm -hmm. When you read those scenes, do you think that it's just physical and you can read about it detractedly, you know, detached from it? Or can you, you know, understand that there's something more there that we are reducing and um, mistaken in, in the way that we perceive it? I'm assuming you don't mean that it's actually pornographic, but that he's. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that accused it actually of being pornographic. Hmm. So, okay. um, but I think so. Again, I, I know you don't want to probably get into Lancelot too much, but Lancelot is from the demonic perspective, and so it's written in such a way that everything that's dark or horrible in the world becomes explicit. And via negativa, then, if you don't want to live in that world, what's the alternative of this world of violence and porn? Hmm. So that's that's what that book is doing. And so just heads up if you if you go into Lancelot is a very dark novel. Hmm. OK. So back to Love in the Ruins, then. Um... I, uh, you know, having read this once, it's just once it's, it's difficult for me to kind of like give a, a big picture of the, of the book. Um, but I'm just kind of seizing on these different, different features of it. Um, this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, angelism bestialism thing is kind of, this is not directly connected, but it also makes me think of the way that he describes this Art Immelman character, which, who I think clearly is a demonic figure, you understand by the end of the book, but he keeps noticing these very, um, very uh, physical details about him, like that he smells like sweat covered over with deodorant mm -hmm. and things like that. These very, these very, there's just some little details about him that are kind of off. He keeps he keeps referring to him as being like a kind of a man from a different time period, like an old salesman from the auto age. Um, 
And uh, mm-hmm. just the way that he describes this character is kind of unforgettable. Um, and and it's it's an enjoyable part of the book, even as it gets increasingly creepy and you increasingly start thinking this guy is more than just a government, you know, mm-hmm. agent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you if you've read the Brothers Karamazov, then you can see where he gets that figure from, because it's based on Ivan Karamazov's demon who visits him. Oh, OK. Um, in Ivan Karamazov's demon, um, he like wears clothes that are out of the wrong era. He appears whatever way that you want him to appear. His speech uh, when the demon talks to Ivan Karamazov is the same speech that Percy rewrites in 20th century vernacular. Um, as far as like you were made to love music and love women and um, yeah. all that, that is all from the brothers Karamazov. And so it was meant to be very much, this novel was supposed to be about possession and what we mm-hmm. end up enslaving ourselves to when we don't freely choose the Eucharist as the center of our identity, right? When we don't choose the incarnation yeah. that happens at Christmas and instead we we live for all these false demons that end up possessing us or these false idols and that's what the book is supposed to be about so so going back to this device i mean how how much are we supposed to i've given that even after kind of his his reversion to catholicism he, he continues working on this device how are we supposed to understand uh his scientific project in this novel are we supposed to like like what is it saying about the relationship between the body and the soul that this device actually does seem to have some ability through scanning the brain to to kind of understand what's wrong with with people is that um is that do you think that's an indication that of the unity between the body and the soul that these things actually do reflect themselves in the chemistry of the brain yeah absolutely he you know he is being satirical because percy as you know, his biography suggests spent many years scientifically trying to heal people and fix people. Right. But right. only by studying their physiology was he trying to fix them. And he recognized that this was a leftover effect of Cartesian dualism in which we have divided the body from the soul. And we feel like we can fix all of the problems that appear to us to be physiological through this kind of scientific means, because we don't want to address the soul. We don't want to address that the problems that we're actually dealing with are soul problems and not just physiological problems. So Mm -hmm. the novel ends the way it does. And Percy wrote it in 71, but he actually picks up the story again in the Thanatos syndrome and Tom Moore Mm. is a sequel in, in that last novel. So Tom Moore, you'll, he'll get to address those very concerns you're talking about um in another book so it it does end but it also kind of leaves the door a little bit open to what's next too there's not sort of uh there's not sort of anti-climax to the novel don't you think Mm -hmm. um in that this uh this kind of this total catastrophe happens we see chaos all around fittingly you know depicted as like flames in the sand traps Mm -hmm. on the golf court this kind of like emblem of humanity having it together uh and uh people fighting and society completely breaking down um and then he kind of just it just kind of skips forward several years and we don't get like a restoration it's just kind of what what's happened has happened and now he's living in you know in happy poverty (laughs) somewhere um and uh you know, humanity is not, uh, it's not a dystopia, but it's, but it's, it's not like the crisis resolved itself. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's several reasons for that. This is again, why I love Walker Percy. So it's called a uh, subtitle is the adventures of a bad Catholic at the end of the world. And mm-hmm. Percy is always trying to write about the end of the world because for each of us, of course, that's what it feels like. It feels like we are dealing with apocalypse all the time. I mean, how much do you see it in our current culture where we talk about things as though it's the end of the world and this now we've reached the end of the world. And and yet in five years, we might be saying the same thing again. It's the end of the world. And I think that that's what Percy is is hitting on is that 
um, we have a tendency to be apocalyptic about the things that happen around us. And it doesn't delegitimize like how, how much they feel like an apocalypse at the end. But we have to always live like today is the last day. That's actually the call of a Christian life is like, it could be the end of the world for you today. It could be. And so there's this tension between every day is the last day of the world and every era feels like it's the end of the world. Um, if it does feel like that, then how then do we live? Right. And so mm. any, anything else is going to be sentimentalizing or um, like you saw in the movie goer, it's going to be people redecorating their house for the 50th time because they're ignoring the fact that the world is always ending. Um, right. And this apocalypse is supposed to reveal to you that there's a greater purpose in life. And if it doesn't, then, um, then how are you living? <laughs> you know, how are you making yeah. those choices? Uh, is there any other facet of this novel that I haven't brought up that you would like to say anything about? Uh, the women. <laughs> okay. So um, we get these different types of women that he has an interest in. And I guess it's not surprising which one he ends up with at the end. Mm -hmm. So his wife left him. She was, you mentioned her. Um, she was the one who kind of was a spiritual person and ended up going off with this uh this Englishman who was into Oriental spirituality, and uh, then she dies, and so he's free to marry again. But in the meantime, he is uh, messing around with three, well, really two different women, and then kind of not messing mm -hmm. around with the third, who he he ends up getting uh, married to at the end. So the easy way to talk about them that is not worthwhile, I think, but I'm just going to put it out there because so many people go this direction is that you have Walker Percy being this like almost 60 year old man, just writing out his fantasies of three different girls he would love to fall in love with. Right. Um, and, uh, Walker Percy was known as being a ladies man. He was, he was charming and women loved him and it took him forever to decide to settle down with Bunt. So that's the easy reading of the novel that I don't think is helpful. What I think is more helpful is to read it in the tradition of um, love in the Catholic tradition, love of human persons leading you to the love of God. And so you have these great stories about what kind of love moves you that direction versus what kind of love moves you away from God. And so right. we have these three competitors that become kind of the um, the direction to move towards God or, or away from Him, and and then in the first two, as you mentioned, you know, one is is really drawing on his physical nature and just lust and body, and you know, they they shack up at the Howard Johnson with all the cans of food and all the the things you would need as a physical person to survive. Mm -hmm. and then on the other side, you have Lola being this draw for what we think of as the human self, right? But it's very humanistic. It's just um, the beauty of her cello and, um, you know, drawing this part of him that he thinks of as himself. And then right. you have Ellen, who cannot be explained except in her relationship to him. And that's mm, what I think yeah. actually really beautiful about it is that um, she's a very relational person, She's not just moral. She is an easer. She is a helpmate to him. Um, she has a fullness of personality that cannot just be seen as only humanist or only physical. There's just so much to her. Um, right. and, and in that sense, that fullness of person is what leads him out of his, his distinct, you know, his Cartesian dualism and more towards a vision of what persons need to be in relationship to one another. Yeah. She, as a good Presbyterian, has a mistrust of things, whereas a Catholic, you know, he has a great devotion to things. Um, but even in their relationship, it is his love for her, which leads him to pray at the end of the novel, right? That's right. Yes. that's, that's yeah. and, and that kind of love, the love that leads you to pray, the love that bears fruit in prayer is a good sign that it's the right kind of love. Before we wrap up... Um... I, uh, you're kind of, uh, somebody has, who has made your mark writing about, um, authors like Percy and O'Connor. And, um, uh, 
when I had Joshua Wren on uh, a friend of ours uh, a while back, I asked him um, if he thought that there was a certain kind of limitation to this mid-century uh, Catholic existential approach where it's dealing with problems that are like very distinctively modern mm. kind of neuroses and hangups. Whereas if you read an author like Tolkien, he's really not kind of, he's speaking to all sorts of modern things, but he, he, uh, sometimes when I read, um, something like the movie go, where I feel like are people, if, if society changes significantly, will people understand the problems that he's talking about in a hundred years from now? It's not that it's not, won't last as literature, but will people sort of get the kind of psychological situation that he's discussing? And I kind of was curious about, uh, where you feel these authors stand in the wider tradition of religious fiction and kind of, um, uh, do you think that there is a certain um, like limitation to the the material that they're dealing with and these kind of very specifically modern concerns? Mm -hmm. I, I would say you're exactly right that Percy is very much writing about the modern world. However, it's going to be impossible to go back to a pre-modern world when, mm -hmm. when we conceive of the problems. And he's writing in the tradition of Dostoevsky and his tales are really a, a redoing of Dostoevsky in his time and place, it, very much in the same way that you know Chaucer is redoing Dante in his time and place. And they're kind of passing forward the things that are permanent into a new time and place for that new audience. But their eternal concerns that they're passing down and their eternal truths that they're passing on. And I think that that's where Percy comes in is he may be writing with a modern flavor, but whoever picks him up into the next generation or passes him down into the next group, they're going to pick up on the eternal parts of his work. And they're mm -hmm. going to have to gloss it and adapt it as they rewrite Percy for, you know, the year 2050 or whatever comes next. Um, but I don't think Percy's going to be lost in that sense. I don't think he is only a timely writer. I think he's writing about things that will always matter about who we are and what it means to be a human being in the world. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Jessica. This was really fun. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you're picking up Percy. I hope more and more people are going to be picking him up and reading him um, just for fun. He should not be limited to a classroom. He was a best-selling novelist. So I hope that this made people yeah. want to read him more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Jessica, um, which of your books about Percy would you direct people towards? Oh, definitely reading Walker Percy's novels. That's the accessible one where I essentially act like you're in my classroom and we walk through Percy's novels for fun. You know, I mean, I, right. I'm hitting each one. Um, my other book on Dostoevsky and Percy, I think what you were talking about, getting to the timeless part of it. That's what I was trying to do in that book is say like, oh, here's what's timeless about it because you can see its connection to the rest of the tradition. Um, so I would say like, you know, part one and part two, part one, reading Walker Percy's novels, part two, go get the Dostoevsky and Percy book. So I will link people to those books and uh, to your website in the show notes so that people can find uh, all the other things that you do. Um, I also understand you'll be involved with the new uh, MFA program that uh, Joshua Wren and James Matthew Wilson have started. Yeah, that's true. I was actually just talking to James today about it on the phone. So that's at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Yep. I'll be teaching Catholic imagination at some point. Great. Great. Yeah. James is uh, the most frequent guest on this show. I think he's been on like seven <laughs> times now. Uh, that's great. Well, yeah, this was great. Thanks again. 